<laughs> anyway, on with the show. This is Lucy, and we are so glad. I told my daughter this is a bit weird for me because I'm not usually talking about myself, and then there was this silent pause, and I said, um, formally, not talking about myself. <laughs> Privately in small groups, of course, it's always about me. I'm the hero of every one of my stories. <laughs> now, uh, Chris asked me, "Do you want to talk about pottery, your collection?" Because I've been collecting French faience, uh, vintage and antique, for over 20 years, and started a club in '99 with a friend, and still going strong. We have members in six countries. Or do you want to talk about music? Because I started playing the oboe at age 55 which is a little old, a little long in the tooth to start an oboe. And I now play in orchestra, two concert bands, our own wind ensemble, play for all the church services every Sunday, and um, do solos with choirs here and there, some Vancouver, some locally. And what else do I do? Oh, um, I produce concerts for the church. Tonight is number 89. You can all go, oh. <laughs> Or what else did I want to talk about? I could talk about being a stand-up comedian in LA for a year at the Sunset uh, Strip comedy yeah. store. Or being an actress since 1984. So there's a history of a whole bunch of, as you can see, I just go from pillar to post, pillar to post, and keep changing and reinventing myself. So I thought perhaps I'd talk about the reason why I didn't reinvent myself. And it's not just the seven-year itch, but I do, I do think that life is rather short, for some it's shorter than others, but when you're in the middle of it, you don't realize it's going so fast until another decade whips by, which is probably why we count by tens, and then there goes another decade. So I, I signed up for my first acting um, adventure when I was six years old. I thought the idea of being a public uh, public speaker was quite exciting. They announced in first grade there was going to be a speech contest, and for the first graders, they would read or recite a book in front of an audience, and would anyone be interested in that? Yes, of course, sounds like fun. <coughs> I went home and told my mother, and she almost fainted. She was a dyed and old introvert and couldn't imagine that, but I had a great time and continued with speech contests, individual interpretation, judged other things, went into acting, musical comedy, played in the band, and then high school was over, bam, shut that door, went off to college, got a serious degree in, in education, and started teaching. But I thought, wow, well, what am I doing? I'm having a lot of fun teaching, but I really miss the acting and the stage work and that kind of adventure. So I started doing television commercials, some radio voiceover, a lot of stage productions, dinner theater, I woke up one morning after the local newspaper critic said, why don't you try this in LA? And I thought, yes, why don't I try this in LA? So by then I had found my faithful companion, none other than Dick Williams. And Dick said, yeah, let's try this in LA. So we packed up and moved to LA, and I did theater and things out there. And after a while, people kept saying, oh, you're kind of funny. You're kind of funny. Maybe you should stand up. And I thought, I'm not a writer, not one thing about it, but not being intimidated, I thought, why not? Why not? Life is short. Let's go do stand-up. So I didn't want to start at the bottom and work my way up. I was already 38, which was a little long in the tooth. So I went knocking on the door of the comedy store on Sunset Strip, which is quite famous, and at the top of the heap, and they said, Sure, why not? Because not many housewives from Santa Monica were showing up to try stand-up. <laughs> well, mainly it was guys 20 to 25, you know, with grunge pants, thinking they were funny. So I convinced those people, let me perform almost every Monday night for an entire year, which was quite a feat. And not exactly professional, not exactly professional, but not exactly amateur either. So I hung in there for a year, and then I realized, oh my goodness, and Kelly, forgive me, but Woody Harrelson and Polly Shore were hitting on my daughter. So I said, go home and finish raising that daughter, because she was 16, <laughs> take a break from that. After a few more years, we retired and moved up here. Kelly's insistence, oh, why, why retire in LA? Come up here, it's more fun. Oh, it's so true, so true. <laughs> 
I, I sometimes I long for LA, the crime, the smog, the tension, <laughs> you know, those things, you just, it's hard to, to live in a house where you don't have to have a door locked during the day when you're in the house, but I've gotten used to it, it only took a year to stop doing it. Um, so we moved in here, because the grandkids are here, and family was here. So innocently, I was just going to retire from everything. Went to a Christmas party, because Dick, who's always been a musician, even though he was a college professor for 40 years, still a musician, um, joined a, a little band to play with. Walked into the Christmas party, and Paul Berry, whom some of you know, quite the adventurer, says, well, what did you play in high school? I said, clarinet. He said, well, you should get that out. I'm like, pigs will fly first. <laughs> so he said, well, the band owns an oboe, and we would loan that to you. <laughs> Glory be, I had played oboe in my mind for 40-something years, because I love the sound of it. So I thought, I'm only 55. I'm not dead yet. Why not start? So I started on the oboe. About a year later, Dick came running down the stairs and said, Joseph Robinson's moved to blame. I said, you're making that up. Joseph Robinson was principal oboe for the New York Philharmonic. The wrong coast. I said, no, you're just, you're teasing me. Stop it. He said, no, they have a summer house in Simiamu. He's playing at the Bellingham Festival. I thought, oh, Joseph Robinson. So I wrote my first fan letter ever, and it was to a musician, Dear Mr. Robinson. Well, he answered that letter, and we met, and I convinced him to take me as a student. So I've been studying with him. This will be our 11th year of studying. And um, his, his bar is up here, and mine's creeping higher. But it's, it's study with the best. That's some of my advice. Learn from the best. Don't learn from the people who are sideways. Learn from the top. So, following that rule, I joined a quilt group here <laughs> and started watching Judy and Rose and some of the other master quilters, you know, working magic with fabric. And I thought, well, I'm just going to make quilts, but I'll at least look at what they're doing and so I won't be frightened. And I've been doing that for a few years with, with some success. I do have quilts on the bed now. But the oboing, uh, oboing led to concerts here, and I started getting asked to play, and the, joined the church here, there's only one church here, and the church in its wisdom decided to become an emergency shelter for the town. That was brilliant, but it cost $13,000 for the emergency generator and all the paraphernalia that goes with that. We didn't have $13,000, so I started producing concerts to pay that off, and then done. And I thought, well, but we're having so much fun having concerts, we should just keep doing that. What can I do with the money? Ah, oh, the kid camp. Kids were being asked to pay for the music camp in the summer. I thought, no, no. It does say somewhere in the Bible, let the little children come to me. It doesn't say how much to charge them. <laughs> so I thought, no, let's, let's run concerts and let people enjoy the music and run kid camp for free and let children enjoy the camp for free. So we've been doing that, and tonight is concert number 89. 89. And tonight, we're really lucky we have Lane Lofton. You don't know her from Adam, but she's a professional cellist that's getting her doctorate at UBC, and when BSO needs a cellist, they call her. She's the one they call. And she's playing for free over church at 8 o'clock. <laughs> so, We've been really lucky. We've had a lot of pros come in here. Over 250 Canadian musicians have come down here to play for free. And a lot of these are people who make money doing this as their livelihood. July the 8th, and I'm just plugging now, sorry, I apologize. But July the 8th, the jazz teachers from the Ladner Music School are coming over here to do a jazz concert for us for free after they finish their own jazz camp, which is very nice. But, okay, ask me any question you want. Hurry, go. <laughs> well, how did you come to Point Roberts? My daughter Kelly, the pretty one sitting there, married Greg Keehan. And I'll tell you a quick funny story about that. When Kelly was 12, she said, oh, I can't wait to grow up and get married. And I said, why is that? And she said, well, because Williams is such a boring name. I got to change my name. So she starts dating Greg Keehan, whom she met at a softball game. After about six months, she found out that wasn't his name. 
He's a member of the Screen Actors Guild. His real name is Greg Kean Williams. <laughs> <laughs> so when you think God doesn't have a sense of humor, just think back on this story. So now Kelly is Kelly Williams Williams. And all of the poor grandsons, all of their grandparents have last name Williams. So luckily they're homeschooled because they gone to school and tried to fill out a form. The teachers would have thought they were retarded. <laughs> <laughs> But that's how we moved here. Kelly and Greg moved up here. They didn't want to raise little children in L.A. They wanted to raise them up here. And Greg's Canadian. So he showed her Vancouver. She fell in love with it and said, yes, why not? So if I was going to say anything to you tonight, it would be don't tell yourself no. Tell yourself yes. If there's something you want to do, something you want to create, something you want to experience, look at that carefully and see Ask yourself, am I telling myself no? And why is that? Don't. Don't tell yourself no. There's another, there's a lot of people out there who don't do that for you. For you, tell yourself yes. Always. Tell yourself it. Well, not for chocolate, but other things. <laughs> other things. Any other questions? <laughs> Heidi. Why do you like my Roberts? Why do I like it? I don't think I could live anywhere normal anymore after living here. Are you me? Oh my goodness. Dick and I were, and I shouldn't say this, but it's the kind of place where you can say this. We're dashing off to a rehearsal in Vancouver last night. We got two blocks away and we said, oh, I forgot to close the back door. I said, oh, yeah, it's probably fine. <laughs> when we bought the house, it took us uh, uh, quite a few days to get the keys. We lived in it for six weeks. We didn't have the keys. And the real estate agent, I called her up and I said, I hate to bother you, but I'm going to Texas for the rest of the summer and Dick is going to LA for the rest of the summer and we sort of like to have the keys to the house. We kind of like to lock it. Um, and she said, I have lived here for 28 years. I've never locked my house. And I said, yes, I apologize. It's my own fault. <laughs> it, it's a flaw that I have and uh, I'm trying to overcome that, but we're just kind of used to that. And we, I apologize, but it would be possible now to lock the house and we have the keys. After three days, they found the keys. They didn't know where they were. They never used them. So, and sure enough, it's Point Roberts. There's a key, different key for every door and there are eight doors on the house. So <laughs> we have to mark which one is the front <laughs> And then, of course, last year, Paul Ferry comes over and says, your front door knob is wearing out. I'm going to get you a new one. Do you want this kind or this kind? I said, this kind. So we brought that kind and put it on. I said, we need a new key. We have to have another key. So, but it's point Robert. The people here are charming and laid back and friendly. And they're more artists. You could spit and hit a nurse, an engineer, or an artist. And I just, I love that. And people say what they think mostly. And if they don't, that's good, too. But, um, <laughs> It's, it's just wonderful. It's the only place in the world you can be a recluse and people think you're an ex extrovert. <laughs> <laughs> any more questions? Is there any food or drink that you utilize to maintain that sense of optimism? Um, <laughs> <laughs> We're substance. <laughs> My father... My parents raised me as best they could. My dad had a wonderful sense of humor, loved to tell a story, loved to tell a joke. And I, I sat and watched him do this for is it 50 years until he finally passed away at 90. And at 90, I asked my dad, I said, do you ever worry about dying? And he said, no. I look in the obituary every day. Everyone who's in there is younger than me. I think I've missed it. <laughs> So, uh, no reason why, why not. When we wake up in this country and in this state, in this town, we're already blessed. And I know people use that word too often, but it's so true. When you wake up in Point Roberts, you're already having a good day. We've got clean water and friendly neighbors, and you're just already a step ahead. So, yes. There's a house for sale across the street from you. You know about it. Nothing. Yeah. <laughs> I'm a recluse. <laughs> I, 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 I don't. I don't know anything about it. No, I, actually, we heard it was for sale because it was across the street from you, and we want to catch some of your containers. <laughs> I want to catch what you got because uh, we came to Point Roberts, and we're, we we came in the trickle part. We've been going to the concerts in the church. And we 
have never been, and you say blessed, we overuse it, but I, I never felt anything like what you put together with the people that you put together. And we heard there's a house for sale across the street, and maybe we could catch what you got. <laughs> <laughs> I'm kidding about that. I, we're not really want, needing a house, but. Well, if you decide to, that'd be great. That'd be great. We'll teach you how to play Wizard, our new favorite card well, game. Well, it's interesting. We drove by there, and you said there's only one problem. There's some old people across the street that play music really loud at night. Oh, I <laughs> that must be Esther and Henry. <laughs> but then they can't resolve the turning of your TV. But anyway, no. I'm saying this is a very, as a very warm and. And, and loving thing that I think Point Roberts is all about and you're all about. And it's a, you know when they say live and let live, we practice that here, we really do. Uh, the, one of the first things I notice is that people wear what they want to wear. They do, they want to wear. If you want to wear something from the 50s or the 30s or something from you know 2017, that's what you're wearing. You know, and people will say, oh, my jacket's too big, my jacket's too small, I'm going to the thrift store, I've got a tuning with me. You know, they, we don't stress about keeping up with the Joneses, you know. I, yes, I have on a new shirt, it's a fancy <laughs> event, but these are old pants, you know, and I got the shoes off, off eBay, so there you go. Anyway, any other questions? Thank you. Anyway, I've, I've got to dash. I apologize. I have to dash. I have a cello sitting at the church. So if you're coming to the concert, come now. <laughs> my, yes, my apologies for, to the other speakers, and I wish I could stay because this is a lot of fun. And thank you so much for asking.